What's up guys, Evil Deer here, and today I wanted to speak to you about something that I've heard from um, a lot of English speakers, but also from some Esperanto speakers, which I think is just a big misunderstanding in their concept. Now this um, was uh, brought up again today in a Red Edit conversation I was having with someone, and what I usually say to people is when they ask a little bit about Esperanto, I say that it is both, it's a language, however it's also a culture and a way of life. Now a lot of English people will just because they don't understand the language will say well it hasn't got any culture it hasn't got a nation where's it from and but also some Esperantists get this confused and they go no it's just a tool for communication now I wanted to just give you my opinion of course I'm welcome to your opinion you know throw it at me but this is what I believe and I think it needs to be said especially for those who are new to the language and learning about it because I don't want you to just think that it's just a tool and then that's it anyway so Basically, the definition of a culture is, and I'm reading off of something here, ideas, customs, social behavior of a particular people or society. Okay, so the first thing it says is ideas. Well, Esperanto is definitely, it has an internal idea with it. Now, not everyone follows that idea. In Esperanto, there's this thing called la interna idea, okay? And basically, it's talking about the whole original objective of Esperanto, which was to be a secondary language for all. Now, a lot of people today say a secondary language for all, but there's a lot of Esperantists, even at the beginning, and as time has gone by, that they don't necessarily want it to be a secondary language for all they actually just enjoy the language for itself but that's one idea now I've spoken in previous V blogs about the different like um, political groups that exist within the Esperanto community itself you got the Finn Venkistoy and you've got the Harao Mistoy but they're just two groups and then there's all these other different shades in between and people that just they don't even care about that stuff at all but those are all ideas and now obviously the associations and all that type of stuff they're all got their own ideas of how it should be now the Harao Mistoy Story, they've you know they design all sorts of things like you got books you got artwork you got um, you know films and music and all this type of stuff now all this stuff is linked in some way to Esperanto it's based around it it's either in the language about the language or about the culture that's been built on the language now that is what I'm talking about with, uh, with ideas now you've got customs Esperantists are very open people you can contact them straight out of the blue and they don't take offense now or they don't feel like they're being intruded upon this is something that's very different to many other cultures it's like uh, for instance when I went to Switzerland I just shot an email off to the local Esperanto community there they sorted it out and organized accommodation for me that is a custom of Esperanto or the the worldwide Esperanto community okay now that's just one particular custom you've got other things like linguistic customs like you know certain ways that we speak and like uh, our own little slang and little you know oddities and stuff like that but that's just like one little thing that I'm talking about now that's all linked historically with like all all the way back to the beginning with Esperanto because we were all spread out it's like a diaspora it's all over the world type of thing so obviously these customs have developed out of a need but now they're ingrained within the actual idea of the culture uh, of the language it's no longer just a secondary tool for everyone to speak it's this is a language for everyone and everyone is welcome and in order to show that we are open to everyone we don't just judge you straight off like you would in other languages like um, if you go around the world where they're like so what you speak my language that doesn't make us brothers but in Esperantuio, um, in Esperantuio sorry everyone is kind of like a brother and it's like I don't know you but it doesn't matter you speak Esperanto and the fact that you speak this language you went out of the way to learn this for no financial gain or anything else like that it just proves that you are someone I want to communicate with now obviously Esperantists don't all agree and they do have battles and some of those battles can be quite brutal but even at the end of all that they still treat each other like brothers and that is something that is an, an integrative part of the actual language now another thing is social behaviors Esperantists we we all <laughs> we've got our own little things like I was saying our little oddities and stuff like that but you know there's things like before I became an Esperantist there's things that I've never even heard of but they're like core parts of this cultural community this worldwide community um, of Esperantuyo like there's there's these things like linguistic justice and stuff like that and certain things that like really 
um, prevalent in the Esperanto community that lots of people are fighting for and going for. And these are all like social behaviors in that sense. But then you've also got things like um, with the language itself, like there's quotes and stuff like that and proverbs that we use on an everyday basis. And people just think, you know, they just came out of the blue, but they have a historical backing. Like for instance, um, the slang um, way of saying, don't speak, say your national language when you're with other Esperanto is ne crocodilu. It, it means in English, don't crocodile. Now that makes no sense to us, but there's actually a historical meaning behind all that. And I read an article just the other day about how that all came to be. And there's heaps of things, like a lot of people would just say, jisla nocto nocto fin. And it's, it just seems like this catchy little thing, but it's actually based off of Esperanto song that exists. So these things are now ingrained into the, the language itself and it's a part of its culture. In order to understand it, you need to understand the musical culture behind it or the literature behind it. And it's not just that, it's, again, it's the literature. Or you've got, you know, the films that have been in Esperanto. There isn't that many films, but there is certain classics which exist in Esperanto. These things don't exist outside of the Esperanto language, like ne crocodilu. You don't have that type of word. In any other language, it's purely in Esperanto and it's based around the language itself and the history of it and why it exists. So there's that. Now it says in the definition of a particular people or society. Now, as I've said, Esperantists, we all come from different backgrounds, but we all have the same um, belief that joins us all together. That, And that belief is that a secondary language is needed for everyone, okay? Now, this takes me right to the end where most people would be saying, well, it's still a tool. Yes, it is a tool, but it is a tool that is 150 years old, that's been passed through generations for some people. I've, I've sat down with Esperantists who's native language is obviously the language of the land but also Esperanto and their children speak Esperanto and they're showing me family albums going back almost a hundred years and saying you know this was my great grandfather he did this in the movement and then my father did this and this and we're ingrained in this and they're really proud about the fact that someone worked on this magazine or someone was like you know the president of this association and managed to pull this off and got this recognition but it's a part of their family and if you told them hey take that away what is left they'd be like there is nothing, this is who I am. And I've spoken to even Esperanto here in Sydney and I've said, is this more than a language for you? And they're like, this is who I am, this is part of me. So this is my, this is my culture. Now, obviously I live within the culture of my society where I am, maybe Australia, the US, you know, wherever you're from, but it's also a secondary culture. It can be an adopted culture, but it's also the culture of some people in the sense that it's been in their family for several generations. Now, remember, a lot of people, this isn't just for Denaskulo, you know, native speakers of Esperanto. There's people who aren't native speakers of Esperanto, but have a long tradition with Esperanto. They've got family members who are in it. They never learnt it as a kid, but then later on, because a previous family member learnt it, they went back to, like, learn it themselves, just so that they can understand their own family line, why these choices were made. And you also have to remember that Esperanto has had a rocky history. We've had internal battles over linguistic reforms. We've had external prosecution and these things have all glued this like the language society together and made it what it is today made it so, like how strong it is like a lot of people ask why um, is Esperanto the only successful constructed language and I think it is because of the things it's had to survive through in order to get to where it is today it's because of that international culture that has developed. Now, it is an international culture, but it's also an Esperanto culture because it is unique to the language. There's so many things that if you don't speak the language, you would not understand. And if you don't know the history of the language, the music, the videos, the, the, um, the works that have been written in it, then again, you wouldn't understand. So yes, it is a tool that has a purpose to be used as a secondary language for all. That was its original purpose, but it has gone beyond that. And for a lot of people, including myself, it's no longer just a language. It is a culture and a way of life. One for me, I've adopted, but it's just as strong as my Australian heritage in that sense. I wouldn't give it up for anything. This is who I am now. And like nearly everything I do in my spare time is some way related to the language. It's reading books in the language, watching music, listening to the radio, chatting with my friends from around the world, you know, stuff like that. 
So it's a part of who I am now. Anyway, I've been ranting for way too long, but I wanted to get this out there because a lot of people misunderstand what a culture is. And I also, because I have a lot of learners on this channel and I want to give you guys an insight into what you're learning. Yes, it's a language and you can use it however you want. But if you want to explore the culture itself, it is massively in depth. It, it, it's crazy how like far in depth you can go with this language. You got to think about it. It's got somewhere between 100,000 to 2 million plus speakers for 150 years of history. That is a lot of history, a lot of culture that exists for you to explore. And you know what? We will all welcome you to that culture. We will welcome you into it. So if you've if you've got any questions, fire away down in the comments below and even myself or another Esperance will get back to you. So if you've liked this video, give it a like, share it around with your friends. You never know, maybe they'll be interested in learning more about the Esperanto culture. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you don't, guess what will happen? Well, I'm not going to be very brotherly about it. <laughs>